Welcome, everybody, to the Heart Coherence Collaborative. We're really excited today. We have our new friend, Ben Greenfield, joining us. And this is hey, very hey. exciting. We've followed you for a long time, so. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Cool story. That's incredible. Actually, uh, you know Brian Scott, right? Oh, my gosh. Brian Scott. Brian, uh, he's Reality done Revolution. Awesome. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you were on his podcast and you talked about um, how you do this fountain of youth, like morning routine. Oh, the, so, uh, the the five the five Tibetan rites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I yeah. wanted to find a way to hold myself accountable in in doing that, and so I invited our entire group to see if anyone would want to do it with me for thirty days. And so we yeah. had a hundred people doing your fountain of youth challenge. That's incredible. How'd you guys feel after doing it? I felt amazing. Yeah. 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 It's kind of weird. It's one of those things where you know you hear about quantum energy and the flow of invisible energy through the body, which of course is what a lot of Chinese traditional medicine acupuncture is based upon. But you don't hear people talk as much about just different movements that open up, so to speak, those meridians, as much as you hear them talk about acupuncture. And because it's not like super measurable or something you can quantify or visualize like the flow of invisible energy through the body. You kind of raise an eyebrow at it, but then you do these exercises. And I mean, it could just be pure placebo, right? Or the knowledge of the story of these ancient Tibetan monks who live a disproportionately long period of time because they do these five exercises every morning. So it could all be placebo, but all I know is like, that's my go-to wakey wakey routine when I'm traveling and on the road. And uh, I always feel incredible afterwards. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So I'd love to, a lot of people know who you are, but I would love to just have you introduce yourself. How did you get to be who you are and what do you love to do? Huh. I love to do a lot. That's kind of my problem. <laughs> there's, yeah. There needs to be a lot more hours in the day uh, or I need to just like somehow make it to heaven and live forever so I can do everything. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh, I grew up homeschooled. Actually, here I'm in, I'm traveling right now, which is why we're doing this via a phone call uh, versus my my handy high res video studio back home. But I'm in Idaho right now, visiting family for Easter weekend, and this is where I grew up in North Idaho. Uh, homeschooled K through twelve, um, with two brothers and two sisters, and kind of in my teenage years, I got pretty interested in some things that went beyond my nerdy uh, homeschooling, uh, passions. And so basically after that, I, uh, I kind of pivoted from like chess and playing the violin and reading fantasy fiction into, uh, playing sports. You know, I really got into tennis. I wound up graduating when I was 15 and joined the tennis team and started college, uh, when I was about 15 and three quarters and basically studied exercise physiology, biomechanics, um, exercise science and got a degree in that, got a master's in physiology and biomechanics, um, studied the pre-meds and uh, took the MCAT and got accepted to a bunch of medical schools and kind of opted instead to go into the health and fitness sector. And I opened up a bunch of gyms that I operated in Eastern Washington and in North Idaho. And then um, eventually got into doing a lot more what I do now, which is like online consulting, writing books, doing a podcast. Um, you know, doing some investing in different health and fitness companies, uh, doing master classes. Uh, mm. I've got a, uh, a supplements company. So, you know, just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But gosh, what I love to do is I love to teach people. I love to learn and then teach people, especially. Uh, that's like, that's my jam is I just, I love to, to kind of like be a little bit of a content junkie and then turn around and figure out a way to disseminate and educate people and help people with that. And then I love uh, right now, I like, pickleball i like hunting i like my family believe it or not <laughs> i, I Just like uh, yeah i like you know all the usual stuff that weirdo biohackers like me get up to you know like breath work and heat and cold i like to exercise i like to compete you know i did all sorts of competitions you know for the past 20 years you know iron man triathlon and spartan racing and adventure racing and open water swimming and Early on, you know, did a lot of competitive volleyball, competitive tennis, competitive water polo, uh, got into bodybuilding for a while. So I kind of like <laughs> physical movement. I don't hold still much, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, those are a few things. And of course, but above all, I love God. Love, uh, mm. I love my, 
love my creator. And, um, you know, I, I love to wake up in the morning and read the Bible and pray and just get, get connected to, uh, to a higher power, which is ultimately where I find the most, you know, fulfillment and happiness. Nice. I love that. Yeah, that was a phenomenal answer. All right. So I have two questions in one. Uh, recently, my buddies turned me on to getting my DNA tested, which I know you are into. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. But one of the big things that came up um, for me was that I had a gluten intolerance, which was phenomenal to, to actually learn. So I went full keto. So my second question to that is uh, I saw you are promoting keto IQ and I, I started looking into it. And it looks absolutely like this miracle shot. So I would love to learn about the DNA testing that you've done, why it's important to you, and then just a little bit about the keto IQ. Oh yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, by by the way, the, the gluten intolerance piece is interesting because you know a lot of people feel like they're sensitive to bread or pasta, yeah. and they get gas and bloating after eating it. But then they will do a test, like a really good gold standard test, like probably the two best ones are a Cyrex mm -hmm. or a Zoomer test for gliadin antibodies and gluten sensitivities. That doesn't flag very high. And the reason for that is, you know, a, a large majority of people, surprisingly large majority of people who think they have gluten intolerance, they actually have a FODMAP sensitivity, meaning they're sensitive to fermentable foods like apples, onions, garlic, uh, wheat is pretty high up there too. And so it's more like the fermentable compounds in the wheat than it is the gluten per se. And so that's just an interesting aside. Whenever I, I hear yeah. somebody, you know, think they're gluten intolerant versus testing for gluten intolerance, when you test, yeah. a lot of times it's it's FODMAP sensitivity is not a not a proper gluten intolerance. But you know, that's just one of the many tests that you can get. You mentioned the DNA test. Uh yeah. man, there's there's so much you can get out of that. You know, I I've run all sorts of different DNA tests from the you know the whole genome sequencing which is mostly useless because we don't know anything about like 99% of the SNPs getting tested to more precise tests that kind of give you a good overview of your so-called dirty genes and what to do about them. Like there's one company called Strata Gene. That's pretty good. You know, it'll tell you if you have predispositions to say like histamine sensitivities or sulfur sensitivities, very common food issues. A lot of people don't know about kind of like the FODMAP thing. Um, it'll tell you your methylation status, which a lot of people are concerned about these days for right reasons, especially because we live in an increasingly toxic environment and methylation is important for the detoxification processes. And you, know, you find out your, your COMT gene, which will kind of dictate how you're wired up from a neural standpoint and a neurotransmitter standpoint. So that one's a good one. Um, one I've been using increasingly with my clients, you know, I have like a lab testing page now on my website with all my recommended lab tests. It's called a three by four genetic protocol. I like that one because they also look at exercise recovery, you know, antioxidant needs, um, you know, what kind of training program, power versus strength versus endurance you might be best predisposed to, along with all the other ones I was just talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, initially genetic testing was just like, who's my third cousin who I don't know about via 23 <laughs> me or ancestry DNA. And now you can take a much deeper dive. And it is relevant to like even the, concept of ketones that you just talked about right because like the ketogenic diet that helped your neighbor lose 20 pounds might kind of screw you over because you've got uh say like an apo e4 e4 gene that would predispose you to high risk for alzheimer's and neural inflammation if more than about 10 percent of your diet is comprised of saturated fat mm. or you might have poor liver and gallbladder function or you might have a really low risk of type 2 diabetes but a high risk of cardiovascular disease and lipid dysregulation, in which case, like eating oodles of butter and lard and the fatty bits of pork chops and ribeyes might actually result in the potential for plaque accumulation, you know, mm. especially if there's high inflammation present as well. Mm. But at the same time, you know, let's say you did have all those risk factors and like a ketogenic diet wasn't for you. Well, now we're in an era where all these different ketone analogs are being developed. That essentially, you know, the best way to describe it is you can drink your way into ketosis without fasting and carbohydrate restriction and without eating a large intake of fats, which can be problematic for some people. And so there's different variants of ketones out there. You know, and initially they're very expensive. I remember when I first got my my first like shot of ketones, you know, a researcher gave it to me. He's like, all right, well, be careful when you use that because that's, that's about $2,000 right now a bottle, you know, in terms of 
you know, to develop and sell. And a lot of these early ketones, they were, um, they were diesters or monoesters, meaning that they were typically like uh, beta hydroxybutyrate bound to one three butane diol, kind of like two ketones. And when you have two ketones bonded together like that with an ester bond, you wind up having like a quick release of ketones along with a slow bleed of ketones. And especially if you were to consume something like that, along with a little bit of MCT oil or uh, coconut oil, you'd see a real big surge in energy throughout the day. Like I, I got up this morning about five and went through my morning routine. And, um, you know, around 730, I took a shot of ketone monoesters. I went and hit the gym, you know, stretching, mobility, walking to the gym, everything. I mean, it was like, you know, mm-hmm. I probably headed out at seven and it was like 845 before I finished. And then I went and got some work done and finally got around to breakfast at around 10 a.m. right before this call, but wasn't hungry at all. Right? Like it completely quells appetite. And interestingly, because ketones are preferred fuel for the liver and the heart, and the diaphragm and the brain, you wind up feeling like you have really good energy levels despite not eating a lot of food, mm-hmm. which can almost kind of like be problematic for some people who are hard gainers or who have thyroid dysfunction or who need to eat more calories. It's almost like it shuts down the appetite <laughs> too effectively. Um, but again, the problem with a lot of those monoesters and diesters, they are expensive. As a matter of fact, some people will see like a three pack of bottles selling for over a hundred bucks. And yeah, it does look expensive. If you actually inspect the label, usually it'll say like 12 to 16 servings in one of those teeny tiny bottles, mm-hmm. which I didn't know. First time I got my hands on one, I like drank the whole bottle. I'm like, oh, I just drank just drank a hundred dollars worth of ketones. Oops. So um these these newer companies though, they're kind of like creating ketones that are drinkable, that are more affordable. Because, for example, in the case of ketone IQ, it's just 1,3-butane diol. And it's kind of interesting because if you drink 1,3-butane diol in high amounts, it's technically like very similar to, to alcohol. Uh, it, it is an alcohol, actually. So you can, you can kind of get loopy if you take too much of it. But in smaller amounts, you get this appreciable rise in ketones that doesn't last as long as like a ketone monoester. or Well, technically, it is a ketone monoester, but it's not a super powerful one. Or, or a ketone diester. And so... You know, that'd be something like ketone IQ. What is like five, six bucks a Mm. shot? And it does a pretty good job. I mean, if you were to test your blood glucose, you'll see your blood glucose lower. If you were to test your blood ketones, you you could do that with a ketone tester like uh, Keto Mojo, for example, a little fingertip blood ketone monitor. You'd see your ketones go up and you'd see your energy go up and your your appetite stabilize. And if you were to take like three or four shots of it, you wouldn't need to have a glass of wine at night because you've got an alcohol-like effect without actually... uh, getting the toxic side effects of excess alcohol. And so there's some interesting things going on there. Um, And then if you were to like, you know, take it along with some coconut oil or some MCT oil, you can kind of increase the effects and and cause them to last a little bit longer than just having the one, three butane dial that you find in something like the ketone IQ product. Mm. But yeah, it's a kind of a, kind of a cool concept that, you know, normally you'd have to fast or really restrict carbohydrates or calories or, you know, go for a long exercise session with minimal fuel to shift your body into ketone production. And now you can just kind of drink your way into that state. Wow. Fascinating. Any issue with like recovering alcoholics drinking that, getting loopy? I mean, um, I uh, uh, be careful. I mean, yeah, you can look at it two ways. You can look at it as like a, uh, as a gateway drug to, oh, hey, that was pretty good. Maybe I should start drinking alcohol again to, oh, hey, I have a perfectly reasonable non-toxic alternative to alcohol that i consume to like lower stress or get that socially lubricating effect without the toxins and so Mm. i can kind of have the effects of drinking again without that problematic compound that had been unhealthy for me in the past you know and and even that company um uh, that makes the ketone alcohol drinks they're called keto hall uh Mm. and they've got like gin and tonic and light beer and moscow mule and a lot of times i mean i (laughs) I went for a while where I'd have like a glass of wine in the evening every night with dinner or a cocktail. And, you know, there's actually a lot of evidence, especially amongst the blue zones that like one drink a day and up to two in some cases has a little bit of a hormetic effect that induces cellular resilience via sparking your body's own antioxidant production. But what happened was I just kind of haven't had any alcohol around for a while. Not intentionally, just, just haven't had it around for a while. So, you know, I've been doing like one of those Moscow mules or gin and tonics with a little squeeze of lime and I'll add a little bit of extra soda water to it with 
every night for dinner. And it kind of gives me like that sipping a cocktail with dinner type effect with none of the alcohol. And uh, I'll admit, like, I have one of them, and I think you still got to drink, like, probably, I would say two or three of them easily to really feel like you've had a glass of wine if you're if that's what you're going for. But, you know, it's it's still kind of kind kind of an interesting compound. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. I would love to hear you talk about sleep. So many people have problems with sleep or don't feel like they're getting effective sleep. So I'd love to hear what you recommend to people to optimize their sleep and also what you do. Oh, I mean, we could talk for hours about sleep, obviously. <laughs> you know, I, 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 wrote, I wrote a book called Boundless and like the sleep chapter alone is like 70 pages long. But that all being said, I mean, if you want to start with the basics of sleep hygiene, I don't want to insult people's intelligence because sometimes they'll say this stuff and I feel like, oh, I'm just repeating stuff people already know. You know, so feel free to ask more targeted questions if you want. But basically, it's uh, it starts in the morning when you wake up as much natural light as possible, preferably via sunlight. If you can't get that, then you would use like blue light boxes on your desk, the same kind they would normally sell to people for something like seasonal affective disorder. Or you'd wear a pair of blue light producing glasses. I'll do that a lot when I travel to shift my time zone to wake more naturally in my new time zone. So there's companies like IO, AYO, a retimer that make glasses that produce a little bit of, of blue light. Uh, you can like not use blue light blocking glasses, use really powerful overhead. They call them biological LED bulbs, but they're bulbs that produce a large amount of light that's closer to the spectrum of sunlight. And just blast yourself with a lot of natural light in the morning. Now, there's a few subtle nuances. Like if you're using overhead, even biological LED light, you're still missing out on like 25% of the spectrum that you normally get from sunlight. So like in my home, like in any room, that's kind of like a wakefulness room, like a gym or a kitchen or my office, 75% of the lighting is overhead LED. And then 25% of the lighting is incandescent or halogen bulbs that produce red light. So you're basically like kind of hacking your lighting environment to get the full spectrum of sunlight, even if you're indoors. And that's something a lot of people don't really think about. But then the other thing when it comes to light is, you know, I said you do that in the morning, but I usually wait about an hour to start blasting all, all those lights up. Because if you think about it from an ancestral standpoint, right, when we first woke up, we'd have sunrise. We wouldn't have just like full on noonday sun. So because of that, I will do what a lot of people do at night in the morning for the first hour. I wear blue light blocking glasses. I walk around the house with like a little red light headlamp, not turning on any any overhead lights. I keep the the dim screen and the night mode on on my screens and my phone. And then after about an hour, you know, I I slowly start to turn on all the lights. So it kind of gives you a gradual what's called cortisol awakening response rather than just blasting yourself all at once. It's kind of like kind of like my take on cold plunging, right? Like I have a lot of friends who just like wake up and they're like, I try to cold plunge within 10 minutes of waking. And for me, that's too much stress too soon after waking. I like to kind of ease myself into the day. But that light in the morning and during the day is so important for the circadian rhythm with light being kind of like the first component of sleep hygiene. And then, of course, as you would probably guess, whenever the sun has set or begins to set in whatever area of the world you happen to be in, that's when you switch to red light. That's when you put the screen dimmers on the phone and the computers. That's when you put on blue light blocking glasses. That's when you start to consider that the rooms in your house that are more sleep or relaxation rooms like bedrooms or the master bathroom, that's more like 75% incandescent or halogen or red light and 25% LED. And you know that's more like twilight. And then once sun is set, then you're just like turn off all the LED and the whole house is just red light preferably or some really warm incandescent or halogen lighting and uh that even includes the bedroom right especially as you go to bed blackout curtains a sleep mask you know making the bedroom as dark as possible even when i travel like i have some i'm you know i, I just have a black roll of kinesio tape you know from amazon and i'll walk to the hotel room and put a little piece of tape over the tv light and over you know the little blinking lights that sometimes look like a spaceship in an airbnb or hotel room but light is one um Cold is another, or like sleeping in a cold environment, about 60 to 65 degrees is pretty good. Or think about it this way, if there's like kind of mild cognitive resistance to taking off your clothes to get into bed because it's kind of cold, that's actually a pretty, pretty good indicator that the room's cold enough. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are even using things like uh, 
chili pad, which uses water to cool the sleeping surface, or a bed jet, which is kind of like an air conditioning unit for the bed. There's that eight sleep mattress thing that cools itself, even though I'm not a huge fan of that because I try to make my my bedroom, and this is important, have as little electricity and EMF as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I try to choose devices for the bedroom that don't churn out a lot of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and EMF and the like, which is important. Uh, And we'll we'll relate to another component of sleep hygiene shortly. But yeah, just basically sleeping in a cool environment, avoiding like a heavy exercise session three hours prior to bed, avoiding, you know, a heavy spicy meal in a few hours leading up to bed. All these things will help to regulate the core temperature and enhance deep sleep by lowering the core temperature. And then there's um, sound, right? Like, especially if you live in an area where there's sirens and cars and dogs barking and door slamming and you know any type of environmental sound, you do want to do your best to cover that up, you know, especially if you're a light sleeper. So this means like earplugs. Sometimes it can mean like a white noise maker in the bedroom. I even sleep because I'm a pretty light sleeper with these soft wraparound headphones called sleep phones, which allow side sleepers to sleep, but still have some kind of a, a headphone apparatus in. And they're wired. They're not Bluetooth. They just plug into the phone, which is in airplane mode. And I'll play some white noise just to cover up ambient sounds. And uh, then when uh, when I uh, I'm at home, you know, I st- I've still got like goats and and uh, roosters and farm animals making noise in the morning. So you know, I I usually you know will make sure the windows are closed and I'm just attentive to sound. The same way I'm attentive to light, and the same way I'm attentive to temperature. And then the last thing this is related to what I brought up with like electricity and EMF, it's stress, right? You want your bedroom to be as low stress a place as possible. You don't want business books by the bedside that stimulate you into thinking about work. You'd rather have like fiction or light reading. You want uh, preferably, you know, no computers or work related items in the bedroom. You also want the bedroom to have as little electronic stress in it, right? So high EMF producing items, appliances, televisions, you know, smart appliances, anything that produces Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, even though you know, I'm not a Luddite and I'm not, I'm not telling you to go like move in with the Amish and get rid of all electricity in your life. Arguably, you know, there's like a third of your life, your bedroom, where you can give your nervous system a chance to repair and recover and where you can kind of eliminate a lot of those electrical sources. So you have a chance to engage in what's called a proper repolarization of the cell, meaning you allow for the cell to to quit having that huge influx of calcium and contractility that occurs when you're just around Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and smart appliances, electricity all day. So that's related to stress as well. Just like don't work in the bedroom and try and limit electricity in the bedroom. So those would be the biggies, just light, temperature, sound, and stress. And that's kind of the, those are the basic components of sleep hygiene. Very cool. We recently discovered NAD. Um, and we're really enjoying that, but I wanted to ask you, I know Dr. Lawrence, um, you've tried some of his other products and I think you're pretty adamant about them. I'm just curious. We've been thinking about exploring other ones. Are there any you'd recommend? From who? Uh, Dr. Lawrence, he's got the NAD, like the liposomes. I might be saying his name wrong. Um, are you talking about, are you talking about John, Dr. John Lawrence in Sarasota, Florida? Yeah. Uh, and, and what are you asking me exactly? Uh, he has some other products that I saw that you were you were talking about on Mitozen that that you were highly recommending. I wasn't sure if like if you could just tell us about some of those. I use his melatonin when I travel. Okay. I think that high dose melatonin has some good systemic anti-inflammatory effects. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think there's like a negative feedback loop where it shut down your own melatonin production, but there's no evidence that there's a negative feedback loop for melatonin and I use pretty high doses. He makes pretty high doses like his liposomal, like dissolvable bars that you put in your mouth or even his melatonin suppositories range from, you know, hundred to 300 milligrams. And so it's not uncommon. You know, if I travel across multiple time zones, I'll sometimes use you know, up to 600 milligrams of melatonin before bed. Mm. And, you know, if you do that much, sometimes you're a little groggy in the morning, but light and this is why this this will help you understand everything I just explained about sleep hygiene related to light. Light kind of kicks melatonin off the cell receptor. So if you're groggy in the morning after taking melatonin, just blast yourself with light like I was just talking about. Mm-hmm. And the grogginess goes away pretty quickly. Um, he also does like some methylene blue products that are pretty good. Methylene blue is a, it's a good antioxidant. It allows for upregulation of uh, cellular ATP production, particularly when paired with things like sunlight. 
or red light therapy. So uh, that, that's another good one. It has some good antiviral effects as well. You know, if you're traveling or if you've been exposed to some kind of virus. Um, so methylene blue, uh, melatonin. Yeah, his NAD is good. He has like NAD suppositories, which are kind of convenient because you can get a slow release of NAD into your system without having to go through the hassle of you know, getting an NAD IV. And because NAD is so important for things like DNA repair and recovery, um, it's a good strategy to you know, blast yourself a little bit more NAD every now and again. And um, I would say the last product that he has is interesting, even though he has, he has a lot of interesting products. He's got a, a glutathione that's like a, um, it's like a glutathione liquid. And mm-hmm. if you've been exposed to air pollution or hefty amounts of smoke, or like I did this one, I got back from India. I was on a speaking tour of India a few weeks ago, and it's obviously very polluted over there as far as the air hazard quality index. Um, you can take that liquid glutathione, you can buy a desktop or portable nebulizer for like 40, 50 bucks on Amazon, and you put the glutathione liquid in there, and you can, you know, nebulizer will like turn it into small microscopic particles that you can breathe into your lungs hmm. for an anti inflammatory effect targeted to the lungs. And that can be really great. Like if you've been a former smoker or you have COPD or you've been exposed to a lot of air pollution, uh, that idea of nebulizing glutathione is, is uh, pretty effective. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. I would love to hear you. We, like Kyle said, we really have loved NAD. And I wonder if you could just talk about what that is and the benefits for people. Uh, it's, um, it's got a long name that that stands for. It's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Essentially, it can, uh, it can work alongside sirtuins like, you know, polyphenols and blueberries and pomegranates and a lot of the dark reds and purples and and uh, uh, even like blacks and blues of the plant kingdom to upregulate DNA repair and also to assist with ATP replenishment and production. So it's kind of used a lot of times in the age reversal of the biohacking community. Uh, it seems to have pretty good effects on inflammation, uh, particularly related to conditions like sleep deprivation uh, or exercise recovery. And so it's kind of got a, a broad range of systemic effects. And most people, when they take it, especially if they're sleep deprived or inflamed, they notice a, a pretty significant uptick in energy. And so there are all sorts of ways to increase your body's endogenous pool of NAD. You could, like we were just talking about, use NAD suppositories or get an NAD IV uh, or even use an NAD patch, right? They make them on patches now as well. But you can also take NAD orally. You know, I have one, one product that I take on a regular basis called NAD Regen. And it's made by BioStack Labs. It's got a few different compounds in it that help the NAD to not be broken down quite as quickly. Then there are other precursors to NAD, like nicotinamide riboside, NR, or uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, or even just like niacin, or niacinamide more appropriately. And those those all can increase NAD, not, not as much as you would get from using an NAD IV or suppository or patch or even, you know, properly compounded oral NAD administration, but they tend to be kind of like the ketone discussion. They do tend to be a little less expensive. And I would say the only thing you need to exercise caution with is research as late as a couple of weeks ago indicated that high dose NR or NMN or niacin could cause the elevation of an inflammatory marker related to heart disease. So, you know, generally more than about 250 milligrams of any of those niacin precursors is something that might be too high of a dose. But you know, I, I would say NAD falls into the category of something that is near the top of the totem pole for my own personal supplementation and, and supplement regimen just because I feel so good when I use it. And um, it's got it's got pretty good research behind it. And you know, so I'll use like a patch or a suppository about once a week, and then I'll just take it orally on all the other days. Hmm. Very cool. Um, you have a really amazing looking masterclass. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about what you teach in that class? Oh yeah. I had a, uh, I had a film crew come to my house for like a week and just film everything like my daily routines and my productivity habits, how I work, um, you know, our food or refrigerator or pantry, how we eat, um, you know, how I, how I set up our, our family our legacy or education or, you know, what I do with my wife, as far as our relationship is concerned, you know, how I set up the bedroom for optimal sleep, how I set up the office for optimal productivity. And we just kind of decided to 
to just collect a bunch of video and then have me teach people via class. So Masterclass is kind of like a book, but it's like an interactive book via video that you go through with little tests and quizzes and readings along the way. So it's a really good way to kind of feed through the fire hose if you just want to overhaul your whole life for personal optimization, particularly in the realm of like body and brain and spiritual optimization. So yeah, we package it all up. And uh, I think I think I give you guys like some kind of a discount code on it. If you go to bengreenfieldlife.com mm-hmm. slash H, HCC2024. Mm-hmm. If you use code HCC2024 uh, at bengreenfieldlife.com forward slash HCC2024, you can get a discount on it. But yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, it's like, a, you know, technically you can consume it at whatever rate you want, whatever pace you want. But most people go through it anywhere from eight to 12 weeks and just kind of reinvent different aspects of your life from your environment to your relationships to your workouts to your nutrition and your fueling one by one and by the time you finish the class you've you've kind of got a lot of stuff dialed as far as you know the the health span and the lifespan and and even the the happiness and the spirituality components awesome that sounds like one i really want to take yeah and we'll have the information in the description and we'll have that coupon code yeah. Because I think there's so many people who would love to get a personal window into what you're doing because there's so overhaul. much. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. So in closing, is there anything that you want to share that is on your mind as some new and exciting thing that you want to share with people, like a tip or a new research or something that you're doing that's new? Oh, man, <laughs> I'm always <laughs> doing new things. But uh, let's see, something new, something new, something new. Uh, I would say, uh, let, let's build on a couple of things I talked about. First of all, I'll, I'll throw a few at you. First of all, for sleep deprivation, um, with the NAD, if you do decide to do that, it pairs really well with creatine. Um, maybe about five milligrams of, of creatine with NAD. It's, it's just a really great sleep deprivation stack. So that's a good one to, uh, to tuck away. And then, uh, for the lighting that I talked about, it can be difficult to hunt down a lot of those lights. So I'll, turn people on to a few good sources. Uh, Bond Charge is a website where you can find a lot of these red light and overhead. They even have one that's a switch. Like with with the same light bulb, you can switch it from daylight to twilight to nighttime in terms of the amount of red light that it makes. So that's a good source for lighting. Um, and then there's this other company called Shielded Healing. And that's the company that I worked with, just kind of walk through my house and analyze the light and the electricity and kind of implement a lot of the things that I was talking about when it comes to EMS and light. So I would check them out. And then um, I would say the uh, the last thing I've gotten really into in case anybody's interested is, uh, is sprouting, you know, basically taking seeds like alfalfa seeds, broccoli seeds and, and lentils and, and sprouting them to make them more digestible to unlock a whole bunch of nutrients and proteins. And, you know, considering how easy it is to learn how to sprout, I just did a whole podcast with like a sprouting expert, so it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. Considering how easy it is to learn how to sprout and how nutritious and bioavailable they are, you know, ch- check my podcast with this guy Doug Evans from the Sprouting Company because uh, you know that's something that I'm including. I don't really have them with breakfast, but yeah, I'm having like sprouts or microgreens with lunch and dinner now, and they're just like, you know, I'd probably spend like nearly a hundred bucks a month, you know, at the grocery store for the amount of consuming and. I can make all that for like five bucks at home. Hmm. Beautiful. Well, it was awesome uh, meeting you and we hope we can do it again sometime. We have tons of questions. Yeah. We can ask you questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys had great questions. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on and, and I'm honored. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. And all right. Thanks, everybody. We love you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.